Hello, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Matt Vella from Time Magazine. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, uh, and I want to welcome you all to this session, this what if session. Uh, our topic today, our question, our big question is, uh, what if our virtual life overtakes our physical life, our real life? Um, so uh, I'm going to introduce our distinguished panel here um, in just a moment. But uh, we've got some poll questions that we asked the public that we spent some time uh, getting feedback on. I'm going to ask the room. We're going to do it the old-fashioned way with a show of hands. And then um, luckily, I have three uh, very bright people who can help me count. Uh, and uh, you'll see that as well as live streaming this, uh, this event today, we also have uh, this uh, Star Wars-esque orb here, which is filming, <laughs> filming us all in virtual reality. So that'll be stitched together and uh, hopefully not, we won't be too distorted um, in VR, but uh, you can uh, find that on the, on the uh, forum's website. Um, you know, these sessions, we've been doing them for a while. They're a little different for, for us. Uh, they're a collaboration between the forum and Time Magazine. Uh, and it's an attempt to try to sort of look beyond today's crisis, beyond this week's crisis, the headlines that we're seeing today, and look a little bit further into the future at, at uh, emerging realities and emerging technologies and how those might impact uh, all of our lives. Uh, we've, uh, as I said, we've twinned these conversations with a poll. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, and uh, I wanted to first uh, introduce our fantastic panel. Uh, I've got names written down here so that I don't butcher any pronunciation, so you'll excuse me. Um, uh, first, we have uh, Pro Professor Justine Cassell, who is an associate dean at the School of Computer Science uh, at Carnegie Mellon. And she's a former professor at the MIT Media Lab. So two institutions that have been uh, inventing the future for many decades. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Um, We've got um, uh, Yobi Benjamin at the end, I'm not going in order here, who is the um, uh, CEO of a company called Glyph, uh, which makes a uh, very interesting headset, which we'll learn a little bit more about, which is not quite VR, but is, has a little bit of a different perspective. Um, and of course, we've got uh, Professor John Rekimoto here, who um, is a professor at the University of Tokyo and has worked at Sony for a long time, and Sony is one of the uh, one of the companies that will be bringing out a mainstream virtual reality headset uh, in the fall. So he has been at the forefront of this technology for, for many, many years. Um, uh, so I wanted to start just first with, uh, with a few questions. So um, a few poll questions before we, we get into the panel. So the first question, um, I don't know if we can get it queued up here, is um, do you feel the impact of digital, te of digital technology on your personal, re on your personal relationships has generally been positive, yes or no? So let's, let's see a vote for, for yes, a positive impact. OK, what does that look like to you guys? About 80, 70 percent? OK, let's see what the public thinks. Yes, 68 percent. OK, so we're a little bit more bullish than the general public, but, but not by much. Um, all right, so, second question, excuse me. Um, would you enroll your child in a virtual school that allowed them to attend classes through virtual and augmented reality without leaving the house. How many yeses to this uh, virtual, virtual? OK, we have literally mm, six people, so very, very small percentage of the audience. Um, it uh, cuts down on tuition fees, though. Does that change the answer? No, OK. Uh, what does the public think? 60% no. OK, so we have, um, we have uh, a an affirmative no on the idea of sending your kids to school in VR. I guess people like to have a quiet house during the daytime, maybe. OK, so I wanted to get into our, our, our panel here now. Um, so Justine, you know, I think if you look back, people have been asking a form of, uh, have been asking anxious questions about technology, swallowing our time, swallowing our attention uh, for uh, you know, since the beginning of recorded time, really, ancient philosophers worried that, as we were talking before the panel, uh, that the written word represented the end of memory, the end of imagination to a certain extent. And you've seen questions like that occur at every major turning point in the developing of technology uh, from the internet to our, our smartphones. So my question for you is, does virtual reality and augmented reality represent a kind of new milestone in that very long um, a progression of anxiety over new technology? Or is there something different about VR and AR that makes it uh, a 
a unique thing to worry or, or hope for, maybe? I, I think it was um, Alan Kay who said that the definition of new technology is anything that was developed after we were already adults. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're fear, we fear, we're scared of anything that we didn't grow up with. I think we also like to feel that we're special. I hear so often in Davos meetings, China Davos and in Switzerland as well, how fast times are moving. They're moving so much faster than they ever did before and the dangers are so much more dangerous and the highs are so much higher and the lows are so much lower. And I have to wonder whether that comes from a desire to be special more than an actual mm. um, accurate perception of history. As you said, when the alphabet was developed, there was a huge outcry that the alphabet would lead to forgetfulness. When the telegraph was introduced, there were two fears that are relevant to us today. One was that um, young people would forget to write accurately. They would write only in abbreviations. Hmm. <laughs> Not something that's relevant to any of you parents. Nothing you're worried about about your own children. There was another worry about the telegraph since 99% since of telegraph operators were young women. Um, they were thought to have the sweet voice and calm demeanor that suited them to be telegraph operators. But their parents worried that they could meet bad men online. Wow, and that get doesn't in, sound familiar. No, I'm not familiar. at all familiar, and get into danger. And in fact, a, an article in 1863 in a, um, a popular magazine told the story of a father who came after his daughter with a gun after she met a man and ran away with him. And the title of the article was Danger for Girls Online. Ah. So I, I guess you see where I'm coming from. We like to believe that we live in a discontinuous era. But time is continuous. And I don't think that virtual reality or augmented reality are any more of a shift than the telegraph was a shift from what came mm. before it. Interesting, interesting. So you know, we, uh, you are working at a company that actually is manufacturing a headset, um, and it would be good if you told us a little bit about how it's different from what people typically think of as a VR headset. But, but I wanted to pose uh, you a, a little bit of a difficult question, since you're actually in the business of selling devices to consumers. Um, what are the risks that we're ignoring? Not, not the risks of your product, just to be clear, just the risk, the sort of societal risks that uh, we might be ignoring in uh, pushing headlong in toward this technology? Um, I just want to make a quick correction first. Oh. Uh, my name is Yobi Benjamin. I'm co-founder co at Avagon. Just Excuse to make me. sure Sorry, our CEO's course. name is Jörg Tewis. Um, that's number one. Um, to answer the first part of your question, which is how our device is somewhat different, then I'll go to uh, then I'll go to answering the second question. So many of you here have seen the demonstrations of the Oculus uh, downstairs and upstairs. And as you can see, the Oculus is a fully immersive thing. It covers your head like a shoebox. I mean, when you wear the Oculus, you sit down. You don't do anything except the Oculus. Uh, you cannot move. You cannot stand. Uh, you're fully immersed. Um, our fundamental belief in design, when we designed the Avigant Glyph, which is, this is now a final product which was introduced in Davos about two years ago, is that people want the ability to see their surroundings. So this is actually a headset, designed as a headset, and then you can bring it down like this. And the difference is we have no screen. And what we do is we actually, uh, send uh, uh, light directly into your retina. So there is no screen. And what the effect of that light is, is the way you see natural light. We basically create an optical system where your retina just sees up, uh, natural light. So it, it's no different from the light, ambient light in this room. So the second question, the second question was, are there any societal dangers or are, are we overlooking uh, certain societal issues as we develop, you know, virtual reality and, and uh, augmented reality. 
And, and my answer to that is, is no different from Professor Cassell, which is, you know, time moves on. Progress moves on. And you know what? There's nothing that's going to stop the forward motion of these devices. Right now, um, one of the biggest problems of these devices right now is you're tethered to a particular place. That you're in some of these devices, you can only sit there. For example, the HTC Vibe, you sit there and you're tethered. Soon, though, all of these devices are something that will be as portable as this. Our next generation, for example, this will be fully portable. You mm. can move anywhere. And no matter where you are, the ability to access a virtual world or an augmented world is going to be just as easy as putting it down on your face, lifting it up, you're in a train, you're in an airplane, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. What that does is it opens a whole new world or worlds uh, that you have never experienced before. To the question of would you ever let your child go to a school that is fully virtual. It's significant to note that there was a 40% number in the general public. 40% is not an insignificant number. That is an enormously large number. And I think, and I believe, and I, th I think my co-panelists here probably uh, agree with me, that more and more content and more and more experiences are going to be delivered through virtual reality and augmented reality. So with regards to are we overlooking any dangers, I see no dangers. I only see opportunity. Mm, interesting. Jun, you've been working in this field for a long time uh, in interaction design, et cetera. Um, what, do you, what do you see when you look out 10 years? What, what is the future you, you see for this technology? And, and is there any difference between the future you hope to see for this technology? So OK, uh, I think that some technologies for just convenience, the more effective Mm. to do something. But the virtual reality and the augmented reality are a little bit different. It's di more directly connected to your experience and also your dream. I think that everybody should have a dream of the, if you can fly, you could fly, or you can be a very special person, or you can be a uh, maybe famous singer, or that experience can be created by virtual reality. Mm. So the, I think that if you can have a more than one life, it should be very I think exciting, and also it's a huge impact on, on education. So if you train around something, the best way is to be somebody already an expert. So I think this is a very huge ex impact on the education training or communication, not just the entertainment. Mm. So that maybe 10 years later, we can see the resolution of the head-mount display will be more than retina. Mm. So the, now the, the head-mount display is already good, but still we notice that this is the artificial one. But maybe within 10 years, uh, there are some distinction, some layer that we can no longer distinct, distinguish the real view and the I virtual see. view. So then you can recreate your own experience. I see. Do you, do you agree with that? Do you think we're on the cusp of uh, erasing the difference between the sort of no. perceived reality I'm, and the perceived virtual reality? I'm still stuck on, on Yobi's claim that there are no unanticipated risks. Okay. I, don't, I don't agree. Um, and I'm reminded, so I collect historical documents that are parallel to the situation today because I love starting talks with a quote such as, the machine is a bad babysitter. It can make your child violent. Don't leave your child alone with it. Love your child, right? Computer but it's actually from a 1972 document that was distributed by the United States government to warn parents about the dangers of television. Mm. So I collect these documents. Mm. Just because the perils are similar to perils of the past doesn't mean that there aren't perils. And I would say about any device that we build, whether it's a pencil, which makes an awfully good stab weapon, to a virtual reality heads-up display that there are, of course, perils. We can use it for good to become the person we wish to be, to become a better person, to fulfill dreams that we otherwise couldn't fulfill, to learn um, without boundaries, or we can use it to get our kids out of our hair um, because we want to work longer and longer hours and spend less and less time with our families, perhaps because money is um, 
is difficult to come by and we don't have the choice or perhaps because we had children for the wrong reasons. Mm. So I think with each of these devices, any of us as, as developers, as computer scientists, as um, people who live at the boundary between the real and the virtual world, we always have to think harder than the general public does about the positive and the negative ends to which our technologies can be put. But, but Professor, wouldn't you say that the negatives are no different from the negatives of the internet itself? I mean, we, you know, the internet itself, while a source of wonderful uh, information and knowledge it's, and interaction, et cetera, et cetera, is also the realm of cybercrime, is also the realm of child pornography, and also the realm of these very, very dark forces. Um, it, so I guess I would agree with you uh, in one aspect that yes, there are negatives and positives of, of every technology, uh, but, my, but my argument is uh, by and large the, uh, the, capa the capabilities that virtual reality and augmented reality provide are just in some ways you know, far outweigh what would be the natural uh, uh, dangers anyway of being connected because mm. being connected itself is the very danger. I mean, it's not the virtual realities that makes it dangerous. It's the fact that you're connected to a world of everybody, good, bad, evil, disinterested, interested, and so forth. Mm. No. I, <laughs> I think you're asking for a balance sheet and we don't have the sums yet. Mm. I don't think it's the same as being connected to the internet. I do want to point out, by the way, um, I ended up writing a, a paper that's been cited a lot about the dangers for young women on the internet because I was so sick of having people talk about um, abductions and child pornography and that's why I ended up looking into uh, the Telegraph. It turns out that the dangers that girls and young women face on the internet are in fact exactly the dangers that they face in the real world. They're more likely to be abused by um, people that they, they meet on the internet um, who are their family members and friends of their families than they are to be abused by people they meet on the internet who are strangers. Mm -hmm. So I just want you all to keep that in mind because it's another another reminder that we need to actually look at the data. And I don't think you have the data yet. I think there are very exciting things um, in store for us with augmented reality. We've already seen that. It has provided extraordinary opportunities. And in my own work right now, I'm building a system for children to help provoke curiosity in a generation of children who've lived with school systems that teach the test, mm. which is a sure killer of curiosity. So I'm building a system that uses augmented reality to help children become curious and maintain curiosity in the face of a, a state um, education system. At the same time, um, with head-mounted displays such as these, we don't yet know who controls the message and how the message might be controlled. That doesn't mean that the head-mounted display is evil. It means that we have to be aware of the possibility, which I think was Matt's initial question. Are there risks we haven't foreseen yet? There are always risks that we haven't foreseen yet. And it's our responsibility as computer scientists, as developers, as technologists, to educate the public on what isn't a risk. For example, strangers abducting your daughter from a first meeting online is less of a risk than somebody you know abducting your daughter um, because of a meeting online. On the other hand, we need to keep our eyes open. We need to never say to the public, this is risk free. Mm -hmm. And so where does that uh, responsibility lie and what's the mechanism? It is, are there features, for example, that you, you, either of you have considered in your development that you just said, you know, uh, we, we could maybe do this, but we're not uh, going to I, because I, the risk of someone getting lost in it is so great? Or is it, is it with uh, public health officials? What, so how do we uh, regulate? We're in, we're in hardware. So, you know, content is not, our, is not the realm that we, that we live in. We have a piece of hardware that delivers 360, you know, 
360 view of the world, you know, ha you know uh, the ability to go and do three, uh, 3D, et cetera, et cetera. With regards to the con, we provide the tools also to make, to allow people to develop content and to take mm. advantage of 360 head tracking and so on and so forth. But we don't control content. And as a developer of hardware, I would never put an auto sensor button on my device. There would be no thing there that says, okay, this is rated R, click here and then it disappears. That's not my problem, nor part of my design philosophy. It's like having a, you know, a television that has like, you know, every time an R rating comes on, it just bleeps out, you know? And I just don't think that that is, from a hardware developer point of view, a, 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 a responsibility. Now, I agree with a good professor over here that content could be, could be malevolent or benevolent, and that we do have a responsibility to go and explain you know, the dangers of content and the dangers of certain things to the public. But from a hardware point of view, from a technology and a hardware point of view, I just don't, I just mm. don't see it. Yeah, yeah I, want, I want oh, to yeah, let Jim yeah, yeah. talk. Jim, yeah. yeah. jump yeah. in, um, please. I think the risk is already there, even in the uh, internet mm. or television. So it's, it's, I think it's not possible to control. We can simply already familiar with the internet. Mm. So the, I, I had an uh, the topic that they, when the people experience the virtual red head, head on display and put off, and the first things they do is to check the sim cell phone, <laughs> smartphone <laughs> to check Twitter or Facebook. Uh -huh. But I think Twitter said Facebook is also kind of virtual reality. It's not, not, not real. Yeah. So the, it's a virtual communication. So they just putting off the virtual reality and still you are in the virtual reality of enlarge. So in, in this sense, the, I think the, uh, the control, who is controlled, there is no answer. So simply, we can simply more familiar with the internet than virtual reality headset. So mm -hmm. we seek the risk for the headset, headman display is simply because we are not so familiar with. So this I is see. still a strange device. So they, maybe we can feel fearness. Yeah. So, so that we fear the devices. Yes, I wanted yes, to. Add, that's a, that brings up a point I wanted to ask you about. There's a, a lot of terms, of course. Uh, with this, uh, there's VR, virtual reality, which are the head-mounted displays we've been talking about. Uh, there's AR, augmented reality, which uh, we haven't quite seen hit the market yet, but are you know more uh, glasses kind of situation that would overlay digital information on the real world. Um, do you see? Um, do you see one of those winning out over the other? Is this a platform kind of war? Or do you think we will, sometimes we will have our black box on our faces and sometimes we will have our, our glasses that we can see through? Um, so, and also the, and one of the change, game changing is the communication. Of, mm -hmm. So the, in the red and virtual reality are mainly used for the synthetic uh, space. But uh, like, like internet, so I think the social net or Twitter is all about communication. Right. So they, if the you, regardless of the hardware quality, but okay. if you connect it to some other person or some other community, I think the, the usage style will be very di different. I see that. the usage will change. What, what do you think? You had, to, you had to pick, you know, a direction to go in for a product that you would actually sell, uh, you know, to be, you to be frank, they're going to morph together the capability, particularly with our technology, because we, we project directly into the retina. Um, it's not a far reach for us to do augmented reality. In fact, it's definitely something we seriously think about versus head mounted display. And the notion of a head mounted display, by the way, if you look at an Oculus is you have a screen here and it's there. That's yeah. basically what it is. And you've seen, you've seen the Samsung where they give you a headset, you put your phone, you put it in there. We don't have such a system. So our system is a virtual retinal display. So we have the capability to play with optics in ways that other people, other technologies cannot. So mm -hmm. it's very hard to do augmented reality. In fact, impossible to do augmented reality with a screen. I see. Yeah. Uh, but in the world of virtual retinal displays, augmented reality is a natural extension of what we do. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's interesting, the, the, the box on the face 
thing uh, is, you know, it's a little bit disconcerting. I think if you saw four people sitting at a dinner table, each with their own Oculus on, you might think that looks a little, a little strange. And actually, uh, when Time put a, 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 the, a Palmer Lucky, the founder of Oculus Rift, on the cover with his headset on, it was a huge internet meme uh, for, for a while, a little, almost a little uncomfortable. But because of the technology's uh, infancy, it, it looks alienating. Is that, are we sort of having an overreaction because we are looking at this sort of Model T version of... So maybe this brings us back to the reason why the vast majority of the audience was in, was in favor of social media playing a role in their lives and not in favor of education um, being carried by the internet or of their children um, going to school online. I think perhaps, and, and I'd love to hear from the audience, one reason perhaps so many of you are uncomfortable with the idea of your children going to school online is that socialization is such an important function of school. And yeah. communication is such an important function of school and, and of reality. And I think um, in my own life, I certainly spend a lot of time on social media, and I'm sometimes uncomfortable with it. Mm -hmm. The ways in which I love it are the ways in which it's brought me back into contact with people I lost contact with, right. people I went to elementary school. The ways I'm uncomfortable with it are the ways in which I may choose it over face-to-face -face communication yes. with someone sitting next to me. That's and in the same way, I think we're in a magical period right now where um, we have two paths in front of us. We have a path that is solipsistic where we grow gardens that we can explore but only if we're alone. Or we can take those same technologies and develop them in such a way as to make them communicative, collaborative, social. Social. Yeah. Right. Well, this is actually a perfect segue. Thank you to our second round of question poll questions. Um, so the first question, uh, I want to see what you think. Uh, would you feel concerned if you fa found out that the surgeon operating on your brain was actually controlling a robotic arm from 3,000 kilometers away? Um, how, how do we feel? How many people think they would not undergo a tele-surgery in the room? Not. Oh, not. Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm switching. No, I, you're against. Okay. What do you, against having this kind of surgery. 30% maybe. Okay, let's see what the public thinks. But it's highly depend who is operating. And, yeah. what, what, <laughs> and what the alternative is. Yeah. yeah. I see. Okay, interesting. Uh, so let's, and uh, second question, um, if your spouse is a little less consequential maybe, but, or maybe, depending on your spouse, if your spouse was away on a trip, would you go out to dinner with their avatar instead? How many would like to go out uh, to dinner with their av the avatar of their uh, uh, spouse? Okay. That's all right. Uh, not very many. We, we have a slight preference for human, real human spousal contact. <laughs> and, uh, and we seem to align again with the, uh, with the public. 64% would, would rather not um, take their avatar uh, husband to dinner. So, yeah. I, I just wanted to comment on the robots because I also work on robotics. Yeah. I, can, I, I will say one, one point with regards to that question. Uh, uh, robotics are far more precise depending on who's controlling it. I think that was alluded to by the good professor over here. Whoever is, mm. whoever is designing the robot or controlling the robot mm. and the, whatever AI mechanism it uses, if it's a good one, I, it's probably yeah. not a bad thing. There's a there's system right now called Da Vinci, which actually yes. does it today. Yeah. Right. How many of you have um, seen the snake out here? Downstairs, yeah. So that snake is actually doing heart surgery mm -hmm. today and with less uh, risk than human surgeons. It climbs through your arteries and can unblock them with fewer... Smaller version of the small, one that's small, yeah. it's, it's, quite, it's quite large. <laughs> <though>. <laughs> but, I have a big heart. Like yeah. I say. yeah, a much smaller, thinner version of that snake is climbing through people's arteries 
so I guess the alternative is, is it a really bad surgeon who happens to live next door <laughs> versus a really good surgeon using a da Vinci? Right, so I think we're hitting on a th theme here of the fear of the general, but higher comfort with the specific. Um, I wanted to throw it open to the audience. If anyone has any questions, please uh, raise your hands, let us know. Uh, we've got a gentleman here in the uh, second row here. And if you could please, yeah, uh, if you could please, I just identify uh, cool. you. Uh, so I'm an economist uh, living in Beijing, uh, and I've got a question for you. <laughs> kind of touched on what you spoke about, but kind of, I'm worried about the idea of having an army of these sort of rock stars that exist in a virtual space, and the implications of what it ha means for society. Because kind of, I mean, it's just my sort of old fuddy-duddy way of viewing the world, but sort of the struggles in the theater of life matter, overcoming opportunity, uh, obstacles, rising to challenges, those kinds of things. And I think if you give most people the choice to opt out of that war and go into a sort of virtual one where they can have that success without that struggle, most people are quite lazy and push comes to shove, they'd probably choose it. And then you have these guys that are all rock stars and sports stars and film stars and whatever they want. And it changes the way that they perceive themselves potentially. It changes the way they connect in society in the real world. And so it's not about specifically the hardware that you're talking about, because I totally agree that that's none of your business. But you must have an, an opinion about that topic. Well, I'm, I, I, I will revert to June over here with regards to uh, having models. Not everybody, unfortunately, we all don't live with the, with the, um, with the comfort and, and the surety of having a role model in life. A lot of us, you know, struggle in life. We don't have role models. And, you know, one thing that uh, a, virtual, a virtual reality world might be able to offer to you is the notion of a role model for whatever reason, whether it's for teaching of math, science, or you know, how you can become a better surfer, how you can be a better archer, how you can be a better long distance runner, and so on and so forth. Um, we don't all have the, you know, the immediacy of the expert around us. You know, the, those experts that we need to guide us and provide, provide us information, they don't readily exist. So on the other hand, I see your point that, you know, you do want people to accept the struggles of daily life. I, I'm not going to disagree with that. And, uh, but I don't think, I don't think it's, um, it's one or the other. It's not a one or the other uh, uh, answer or decision. It's hmm. like both of those situations will, will exist in your current life or your future life. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to you to take whatever fork you want to take. Mm. June, do you have a, since this was your theory. Yeah, you. <laughs> mm. um, but I think the, it's a natural desire to have a, another life. So the, it's a very simple dream. So you, you could be anybody else, or you could you'd experience a very special moment. You, you can, I think also the, the source of entertainment so if you were watching Star Wars, you can be one, one of the Star Wars actors. So the, I think the virtual reality is nothing different from the, these technologies. So we so second we life, the, the famous virtual world is, yeah. is still maybe the people but are I not. think also that I don't, I personally don't like the completely synthetic shared space like a second life. It's, it's, quite, it's very boring because the real life is much more complicated and much more exciting. So the, I don't, uh, my research was more concentrating on connecting other person's experience with a uh, camera like that, that one. So i creating the 330 degree head mounted cameras. So you put this one, and then your experience can be shared. So the sharing experience itself is real. Even though you we, uh, we were using virtual reality technology, but we are creating a world, not, not virtual. It's real. So the connecting real and real is a more do you, do you, that's, that's kind of inter that's interesting yeah. because uh, Google Glass, who a lot of you know, you know, the lesson of Google Glass is, you know, that camera in front was the killer, was the killer feature that killed 
Google Glass. Right, right. Like and uh, you know, we, when we designed this, we have every opportunity to put in cameras over here, multi-dimensional cameras all over this. What we chose not to, because we feel that once you put a camera in front, and based on the Google Glass experience, we think that people will freak out and think that they're being recorded. And maybe it'll change, uh, uh, Professor, in the next few years. But based on the Google Glass experience, I think there's a lot of people who don't like the idea that you're automatically doing their, taking a video of them without their explicit permission. Right. And well, it's, it's, a, it's a social cue thing, yeah, yeah. just like if you uh, were to walk out. It's just and a, if you were to use your Oculus Rift at Starbucks, you might oh, get yeah. a few glances. But I <laughs> Try wanted, that in Starbucks, yeah. you know? It's like your Oculus Rift with a camera. I wanted to get a <laughs> few more questions here. Uh, this uh, person in the front row here. Oh, it's uh, this gentleman here. Thanks. It's working. Hi. Hi, my name is uh, Brian Michael Galvin. I'm a journalist for Beijing Review. Uh, thank you for uh, speaking about this subject. I have two questions. And, you, and uh, you're, sorry to interrupt you, but are you wearing a, a camera there in your, uh, is no, that this, a camera? This is, this is just the actual device Oh, okay. Device sorry, sorry, sorry. For, sorry. Yeah. sorry about you. <laughs> you have a camera. It's okay. We've got 50 yeah, we're cameras. we're taking pictures of it, everybody. It wouldn't, and, and <laughs> wouldn't, it wouldn't be a problem. Take a picture anyway, then. Go ahead. <laughs> but, uh, so sorry. I have two questions. The, the first one is uh, kind of a hardware question for Benjamin. Um, so we saw a display over there, very interesting about mind control. And I spoke to the inventor and he said uh, he's uh, using technology to pick up on human emotions, right? It's so not just uh, signals like mechanics, but also emotions and be able to apply that in the future, right? Can, can this technology be applied for virtual reality in, in, in the following years and, and how long would that take? And uh, sorry, about the second question is maybe for all of you. Can you kind of stretch, because uh, the professor here have said, has said that she wants to help educate the public on the risks or potential for this technology, right? So can you kind of uh, stretch your imagination and think about what would be the, the, the most riskiest scenario you could think of uh, for this being applied maybe in the next 20 or 30 years when it's more advanced, right? Like even now we have problems with people becoming internet addicted, right? Mm. And uh, we also have problems with uh, people who maybe can differentiate from the virtual world and the real world. What do you think about that? Um, let me try to answer the first question on, since that was a hard work, hard work question. So uh, another one of my companies is called Hanson Robotics. And the Wall Street Journal just did an interview of Sophia, uh, who is a sentient robot. If you guys would care to look at it, if you can get to the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, she was interviewed live by a team of journalists um, by the Wall Street Journal, and you can talk to her in the same way I'm talking to any one of you. Natural language, natural language uh, responses. The way we do that is her, her eyes are actually cameras, and we have AI systems that actually can detect your facial, uh, your facial features. You're wincing, you're smiling, you're kind of like smirking, you're kind of like, you know, you're kind of like nodding your head, you're kind of like saying no. Uh, she detects all of this and she responds, um, you know, conversely in the way you would expect a normal response. So uh, there is already technology now. Um, in, in fact, we open sourced, we, our technology, our software is open sourced, where you can actually have, you can take optical, um, optical cues basically through lenses and then react on them, whether it's reacting to a facial expression or reacting to you know, a, see a scene or a scenery. So that would be my answer to the hardware question on, on that. So I think this, so the second part of the question was a kind of nightmare scenario question. Uh, in my that would also like any, uh, put your like, imagination on maybe nightmare, also maybe like okay. Media. Give us yeah. one utopian scenario I'm, and I'm one ap ap apocalyptic. I, I, I just kind of set myself up in a position that I don't usually take, which is the naysayer. And I think there is far more possibility than there is peril. What I would say, though, is, and, and really this is what I intended, the point I intend to make, is that it's up to us that we can't abdicate responsibility of how these technologies are used as technologists and as consumers. We're the ones who call for particular technologies, and we call for particular uses of technology. So we'll decide what content 
gets projected on Yobi's um, retinal displays will decide what kinds of technologies get built. I'm really fascinated that today there are two extremely different um, trends. One is towards virtual reality, and the other is, I think, the exact opposite, which is the maker movement. And what I mean by that is we have a group of technologists pushing forward the hardware and software that allows us to move away from the physicality of the real world and live in an alternate world. And we have a group of technologists pushing the hardware and the software that allows us to build objects to think with, to build objects in the real world. What's telling to me is that those who know something about education are siding with the maker movement. And I think we would do well to add an educational component. In fact, more fundamentally, and this is what I try and do with everything I implement, we would do well to allow the consumer not just to consume, but to produce. We always do better for the world when, our, um, when we allow the world to, to, to create the hardware themselves, mm. to create the software, to use it for their own ends. Because then we're using these as objects to think with. So the virtual people that I develop, um, and some of you may have interacted with Sarah, the socially aware robot assistant who's out there, uh, the project that I showed here was a project that the WEF commissioned from me as the front end of the Toplink app. But the other virtual people that I build these days are um, virtual uh, learning companions for children. They never teach. They never teach. They ask children to teach them. Or hmm. they ask children to collaborate with them to together make knowledge. So for me, the nightmare scenario is when only one person is involved for any of these technologies. Hmm. And the promise is everything that we can do to turn over the making of technology to everyday people and to allow them to dream through making their own future and allow them to learn through getting their hands dirty with these technologies. Hmm. It's, it's interesting. I've seen Software Professor where in, you actually look at an object uh, on the computer, and what it automatically does is it translates it into a 3D printer plan, and then it automatically goes and gives instructions to a 3D printer, and then, then makes the object that you just saw so, on uh, a two-dimensional screen. Mm. Um, That's pretty cool. It's cool, but even cooler is some work by Jesse Shell. He's a game designer. He's an extraordinary game designer. And he built this really cool thing. I really wish I had thought of yeah. this, which is why I'm sharing it. He built a game to teach physics to um, preteens. And the way it works is you're given a set of tools to design a roller coaster. And the physics is such that you have to get enough speed going up no, wait, you have to get enough speed going down that you can go up the next I see. hill. Yeah. Interesting. And kids can try it and try it until they can get the roller coaster to do what it's supposed to do. And then they put on a head mounted display and they ride the roller coaster. And it mm, either cool. makes mm -hmm. it up the next yeah. hill I see. or it doesn't. So, and then they go back to the mm, drawing board. June, what, what do um, you think? I think the my personal opinion is that Utopia is a very boring place. <laughs> Utopia, Utopia is a boring Utopia place. Utopia is a place that there is no changing, no, no ambition, no innovation, because the innovation means there is something unsatisfied by somebody, so they, they want to solve it. So this is a source of innovation. The Utopia is very, maybe, stable space, but no invention, no innovation, so not so exciting. So this is my personal opinion. So, the, so the, if the place with a lot of innovation, there should be also very risk. Yeah. Sure, so yeah. we are, I, I love the change. So changing world is more exciting. Yeah. So this is, I, and also the, uh, the nightmare scenario of virtual reality. So virtual reality is very strong. And one group of Stanford University, uh, they try to add uh, mental uh, effect on virtual reality. So they asked some subject group to, to be a superman. 
So you put on head on a display and you can behave like a superman flying away. And this, another, another group is just watching the flying experience without any interaction. And after this experience, the people of the superman group is more positive and more tend to help other people. So it's the, the virtuality of even the small uh, the time period affect on the, your mind. So then we can use, maybe we could use this for the bad purpose. So you, we I can see. program right. somebody's mind with virtual reality. So it may, it may be a uh, very nightmare okay, scenario. Yes, mind, mind programming mind as controlling a by nightmare, scenario nightmare scenario is a pretty, pretty yeah. nightmarish one. <laughs> yep. Oh, uh, so sorry. Uh, do we have other questions? Uh, there's one here in the front row. And maybe after really the gentleman in the back uh, row. Session. My name is Bijoy George from uh, HCL Technologies. Uh, we're speaking about the theme is about virtual world, virtual reality taking over the real world. There was a topic on, there was a uh, debate on risks also. Is there any work done that when you have these three things, you have hardware extremely advanced, you have the content which goes into the hardware, which could be any kind of content, but you have a human being using it. And you mentioned, Professor, that uh, at the end of the day, we have to be responsible for what we do. But you also mentioned that the content can have an impact on our mind and allow us to be positive or maybe even negative. What if the combination of extremely powerful hardware with this different kinds of software used by a human being results in actions by the human being which are detrimental? Where does the liability lie? Mm -hmm. That's a Where great is question. Liability? Are you talking right. about legal liability? Yeah, at the end of the day, when there's risk, there's liability yeah. in the legal. That's in good, today's world, great. that we have to take care of those things before some, I mean, then the hardware wouldn't be sold, the content right. wouldn't be brought on, we wouldn't be able question. to use it. In the United States, you know, where we are very litigious, you know, you can, I, you could, anybody can make up a lawsuit on anything, on, on any, oh for any time. Can I, can I turn the question around to you and ask you where the liability lies? I'm going to give you a story and you, yep, and you tell me where you I think the liability, the liability lies. lies. Wait, no, I'm going to give you a specific example. Hasbro, Hasbro. in the late 1990s worked with iRobot mm -hmm. to make a baby doll. And the baby doll didn't stay on the market for a very long time. <laughs> and here's why. It had an extremely advanced computational model of emotion. When you tickled it, it laughed. When you fed it, its happiness went up and it was happy. And when you hit it, it cried. Well, they delivered it to market and lots and lots of children held it by its feet and shook it so it would cry. And they had to take it off the market or they decided to take it off the market. More children shook that baby doll then fed it or tickled it. Where does the liability lie? <laughs> nice. <laughs> Parenting. <laughs> so we're humans. Yeah. We have good impulses and not so good impulses. Interesting. Jen, yeah. what do you think about, about liability? A lot of video, you know, this has happened. This has been a big question in video games, certainly recently, but for, for the last uh, 10 or 20 years, um, you know, what, what do you think the liability life. issues? Mm -hmm. I think it's not, not just about virtual reality. So the, any content, any content should have a same, basically same. So the, uh, the movie maker, Takeshi Kitano, Kitano Takeshi is a very famous Japanese mm -hmm. maker. He is a very violent movie. Yes. So there's some uh, critics, the, he, if the, they, he, he created bio, uh, movie with fear of violence, so this increased violence. But actually, there are far more movies with love stories, but still we don't <laughs> <laughs> have enough love. So the, I think the, the effect of the yeah, movie is not still limited. I, I, and I, as a gamer, yeah. and I played every violent game there is, probably, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I, I don't see, I, I, somehow I just don't see the linkage um, some people will say, well, you watched a violent movie, there, therefore you're going to grow up a violent kid. Yeah. You know, I, I, I really, you know, I, I would say those are the edge cases. The edge cases. You know, I don't really see them as like, you know, if you watch, if you play any, any game that's violent, that will automatically turn you into like, okay, you're going to be, 
you're going to be stealing cars Something's tomorrow, yeah. you know, and yeah. you're going to be down in L.A. going like, let me find every car that I can break into. Come on. Interesting. And even if you can do that in a hyper-realistic virtual reality that makes you think maybe you could get away with it in real life. It just doesn't, it, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. All right? We would have an entire generation, an army <laughs> of children breaking into cars, okay? Yeah. Uh, or at least jumping on turtles. Or jumping on turtles, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure we get to the second gentleman's question in the back here. Or mushrooms. No, collecting yeah. mushrooms and jumping on mushrooms. Hi, uh, David Katz from PayPal. Uh, thank you very much. Really interesting. And, and we've heard a lot about different verticals and how different technology works. And you've got AR versus VR versus avatars and robotics. And some of that's us going into a virtual world. Some of it's kind of the virtual world, in effect, coming out to us. Um, how do you see these different technologies? What's the ecosystem of a future VR world look like? Are these technologies compatible? Do you see them converging and becoming a, a total ecosystem? Or are these in tension in some way? We're going to have one win, one lose. And I'm just, how does this, how does this ultimately come together or does it come together as, as a connected uh, technologies or, or are they in tension, I think I, is the I'm question. Gonna, I'm going to try to take a hand at that. Uh, what I, well, it, it, we, do this, we do what we do because, you know, we design things, we build things because we want to sell it, somebody's got to pay for it somehow, right? And so a lot of the work, for example, that, we're, that I'm, I'm doing right now is in the area of elder care. So what I'm really seeing is, you know, there are ecosystems building around certain verticals. Elder care, for example, depression management. When you get depressed, you don't take your pills. You don't take your pills, you start not able to walk. You're not able to walk, you start slipping. You fall down, then you go down. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at that entire industry, it's a, it's a half a trillion dollar industry. And the interesting thing about it, why it's the most interesting industry, at least to us, as we develop uh, solutions around robotics and virtual reality, is there's somebody who's going to pay for it. In the United States, it's called Medicare. You know, and because we know exactly where the money's going to come from, we're not focused on millennials in robotics. We're focused on uh, medical use and healthcare use in robotics because we see a revenue source that's very clear, we see exactly who needs it, and we know who's going to pay for it. At least that's, that's been uh, at least the trend in what, what I do. I don't know about the two professors over here. June, what do you think the ecosystem of these ecosystem looks um, like? I think there should be, will be YouTube for virtual reality or uh, Facebook for virtual reality. So they, I think the, who is creating content and who, who can want to see. So this, this is one, one way of, of creating ecosystem. Mm. I think it's going to be let a thousand flowers bloom. Mm. I think that these, um, that perhaps we'll be able to see content across platforms. One way to look at everything that we've talked about today is as a platform, mm. a medium. And, and in fact, <laughs> Yobi, you opened yourself wide up by saying, I build hardware, I don't care about the content, that's not my problem. Talk about avoiding liability. <laughs> so if that's the case, then the three of us build platforms and the content will in the future, I believe, be cross-platform. We'll be able to read our email right. in virtual reality or spoken by an, uh, an agent, an autonomous agent, or on a, right. um, a mobile device. Do you agree with that? Because that's certainly not what we're seeing in the mobile arena right now. You've, you're either in Google's world, and Google tries to keep you in that world as long as possible, or in your, you're in Apple's world, and Apple tries to keep you. There's not a lot of, that is not the trend but with those, mobile. But those are not um, one platform or another. Those are one brand I or see. another. I see, interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> Do we have uh, other questions over here? I, I haven't done a great job of looking around the room. OK, I, I, I wanted to ask, just as a sort of final, final question, you know, we're here at the forum. We're looking out for opportunities and, and major shifts. Is there a tipping point for this technology? And, and what is it? If you look at the sort of wide adoption, because we're in this it's a very limited phase right now. They're, the headsets are still quite expensive. They're mostly for video games. The supply is going to be constrained for the next two years. Um, but if you look at you know, the, the history of technology, there's always either a killer app that makes people say, 
hey, I would like to have this technology, or there's some kind of external event, you know, where in China uh, there was a certain epidemic that happened here that really shot up the use of cell phones. So it can either be a sort of external event or, or something about the technology. But what is, what is that tipping point for VR since we're not quite there yet? Uh, my, I think the tipping point comes from with material science coming into play. Lighter, a li lighter device, thinner, lighter device. Uh, I, I personally am not a great believer in, uh, you know, a shoebox in the head. I think that as we move towards a much lighter device, and, and it's a material science point of view, uh, I think you'll reach a point where you go like, oh, it's as light as a regular little Bluetooth All headset. Right. So it's the, it's the hardware for you. And how far away is that? To be uh, if you were going to bet 18 months, okay. <laughs> 18 months. All right. The future is coming in 18 months. Jun, what do you think? Is there a tipping point? Is uh, it an application? Is it a, an experience? Also, I think the comfortableness of the Hetman display is still not satisfactory. Okay. And also, the, there's a two mediums. One is like a computer, personal computer. You are like this one, yeah. focusing on. And the TV is like, you can like this one. Yeah. And maybe smartphone Lean kind of, yeah. I so the, you relax and uh, for watching for a long time. I but see. the headphone is still kind of this. It's so you are concentrating on a very short time. So the, my, maybe the tipping point, if the, uh, some headphone is quite comfortable, you, you, you can do Comfort. It. And uh, Comfort. Three, uh, three hours more. OK. Yeah, this, you, this would change. Interesting. OK. Do you agree that this is, uh, the tipping point is mostly about the, the physicality of, of, putting, of getting into v, going into VR? Or is I it? I think those are good a priori. Those are good uh, reasons in terms of production to make this a viable technology, to make these viable technologies. But I think in terms of what's going to bring them into widespread use, it's the massive um, change in how people work. I think we're going to see a lot more distributed work yeah. than we do today. And yet the social aspect of gathering around the coffee machine is not going to be less important than the future, right. in the future than it is today. So I think um, gig work, uh, short work, um, distributed teams, on-demand teams are all going to require quick ways of building interpersonal closeness amongst the members of a team. And I think that technologies that can build a social infrastructure amongst people to facilitate non-co-working right. are going to be... I guess my yeah. question for you is who's, whose job is that? Is that the job of... Uh, developers who are developing for VR platforms? Is there you know, someone going to make a Slack for, um, for the Oculus that is somehow more compelling than on the desktop? Or is it the responsibility of the people who are creating the interfaces or, or managers? You know? You know, it's a market question. It's, right? a, it's a use case thing. I'll, I'll, end, I'll end with an anecdote. Where, uh, we're, de we're devising something for a, very, for a very interesting Wall Street company. You know, real estate, by the way, if you're in New York, is very expensive. So these guys are actually in trading desks with four computers, right? Well, it takes that nanosecond for you to switch from one screen to another is too long. Mm. Yeah. So what we're, doing, what we're doing is we're building basically, he's still in his cubicle, but now he's got 16 monitors. And he's just looking up and down, and up and down, and can execute an order pretty much as he looks up, rather than switching screens. He looks up, clicks down, order executed, done. And you're now on 16 screens in the same real estate. You're not. You're still in your cubicle, but you're now looking at 16 screens simultaneously. Mm. So that's a use case that's active, that we're actively working on. Yeah, John. What do you think? Uh, Mm. Yeah, interesting. You agree? Interesting, you agree. Interesting. Okay, good. All right. So we have some consensus here at the end of the panel. I think uh, we want to. I want to thank all of you for a great discussion, very rich. Um, and I think maybe Jun has the line of line of the afternoon with uh, Utopia is a boring place. So thank, I love please, that. Th yeah, great. please thank our panelists. Thank you for coming.